Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. So, <coughs> since everyone's here, we're going to begin a little bit early. We're all excited to hear the second keynote speech from Professor Gary King. Uh, I'll first pass the microphone over to Professor Yu Shan Wu. So please give your attention to It is indeed my great honor to introduce to you um, Professor Gary King. Um, everyone knows that Professor Gary King is an expert, I mean the expert, um, in um, technology, um, in political science, and in uh, social sciences. His methodological innovations contribute greatly to the reshaping of the methodological foundation of political science. Um, so it is our great honor to be able to have him here to give us not one but two you know, speeches. Um, after talking about the reverse engineering, the Chinese uh, government's um, information controls, today he's going to talk um, about the um, matching methods, where there's a simplified way of dealing with that. Um, Without any uh, further delay, let us give a big applause to Professor Garotti. Okay, so it's a big contrast from yesterday where we talk about uh, an actual substance of results and this is methods. I don't think I've ever given both talks to the same audience. So, um, so I'm, I'm thrilled uh, that, that you're all, you know, the, uh, my people, you know. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about uh, causal inference and matching in particular. Uh, this will give you a sort of an overview. Um, there's three problems, three solutions. I'll probably just talk about the first two depending on what we get to. Um, uh, first of all is the, uh, the most popular method of matching called propensity score matching. You all know, you've heard of propensity score matching? Yeah? Okay. Don't do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, that that's a summary of that part of the talk. <laughs> um, and it basically sounds completely magical. You have lots and lots of covariates. It's not possible to find somebody that, that you have one observation who's, who receives treatment, one person that receives treatment, and another person uh, you want to find who didn't receive treatment, who's alike in all respects of the first person, right? It's hard to find that, right? And, if you have, and the more covariates you have, the more informative your analysis is, the harder it is to find the, to, to find the match, right? So the idea of propensity score is there's a way of taking the, let's say, 35 variables that describe each person, which it's very hard to find another person that matches on all 35 variables. Instead, you, through this, the magic of propensity score, you squash it down to one variable, and then it's easier to find a match. Now, that just sounds sort of magical, doesn't it? It is. Um, it, it always bothered me when I learned it. I always thought there was something wrong with it. And it took a long time, but we wrote this article, why propensity scores should not be used for matching. Um, propensity scores are great. Um, matching is great, but the two together are a disaster. And I'll, I'll, explain, I'll explain why. Um, second is, um, uh, do powerful methods have to be complicated? And we, we come up with a, a method of matching that's very, very clear, very, very simple, um, uh, and turns out to be statistically very powerful. It's so simple that actually, if I was going to teach an intro course again to, to brand new students, like freshmen in college, uh, and I wanted to teach causal inference, I would teach matching via course and exact matching before I taught regression or anything like that. Like that's exactly the opposite to the way, or the way I learned it anyway, we, we were, where you want to do causal inference, you learn regression, then you learn the problems in regression, then you try to change, correct for the problems in regression, then you might do some other things, and then you might do matching. But I think actually it's much simpler to start with matching because it's actually, the, it's actually it, it conveys very clearly what the what the control group is and what the treatment group is, and that's the essence of all caus causal inference. And then when you realize when you're teaching a freshman, uh, the freshman how to do this, and they say and they realize themselves that they're not going to be able to find a match exactly. They will invent themselves the idea of taking a nearby point. And then you say, well, how do you take a nearby, uh, so, uh, someone who's close? How do you measure close, right? Well, you have to extrapolate. How do you extrapolate? Well, you may, why don't we draw a line, right? And then they basically can invent regression, right? Um, so uh, I think it's much more motivating. Anyway, uh, this method is very simple and very powerful. 
And third, if we get to it, um, matching methods tend to optimize imbalance between the treated group and the control group, because that's the point of matching methods. It's to get a, a, a treatment group and a control group that are the same prior to treatment. Because if you only give the healthy people the medicine and the unhealthy people uh, the, 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 you know, the control, then it's going to look like the treatment has an effect when, even if it didn't have an effect. Right? So you want, you want balance. But at the same time, the way you get balance is to prune observations. It's, just, it's counterintuitive. You throw away certain observations, and then you can get the, the treatment and control groups more similar. Um, but you don't want to throw away too many observations. right? That's the point of observational data analysis, to collect the information. Um, so um, so uh, most methods either optimize imbalance, and you have to check for the number of observations, whether you have enough left, or it, it tries to uh, get the largest number of possible observations, and you have to see whether you achieved any balance at the end of the, uh, of the procedure. And so you really should do both. And so we have a method that does both. So these are the three points that I'm, I'm, I'm going to describe, or at least the first two. Um, so let me start with matching to, to reduce model dependence. This is a figure from a paper that we wrote in political analysis in uh, 2007. So we have education on the horizontal axis, and this is a hypothetical data set, which you know I, 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 didn't, I didn't even go so far as to make up the actual name for the outcome variable. <laughs> um, so these are some treated units, um, you know, where, where your, your treatment variable is, let's say, a 1. And these are some control units. Uh, where your treatment variable is a zero. Okay. And, and the goal here is to figure out what's the effect of T versus C, treatment versus control, on the outcome holding education constant. That's sort of what we want to do. Okay. Now, in the traditional way, the way that we would have learned it in graduate school, the way I learned it in graduate school, is you run a regression. You run a regression with the outcome as, as the outcome. <laughs> um, the, the key causal variable is T versus C. So that's a dichotomous variable, right? It's, you know, red versus blue. And then the control variable is education. So you run that regression of the outcome on, uh, on a constant and the, and the uh, treatment variable and, and education. And th this is what it looks like. <coughs> um, I have blue fit to blue and, and red fit to red. And so now the causal effect is blue to red, right? So if you apply the treatment, the outcome goes up. Everybody see that? Yeah? OK. Um, so, but if you look at it and you think about it, wait a minute, you know, I was going to write up this article where the effect was going to be negative. And this is positive. So what's a, what's a researcher to do? Well, you look at it and you say, it doesn't really fit that well. Maybe we should have a quadratic equation instead of a linear equation, right? That seems plausible. The word plausible has gotten us into more trouble than any other word in the <laughs> Um, so let's run, a, let's run a quadratic equation. So now we run a quadratic equation. It even looks like it fits a little better. Um, and now, instead of going linear from blue up to red, now with the quadratic, it goes from blue down to red. So now the causal effect is negative. This is much more convenient for the analyst because now we can pick whether we want to write up a result with a positive effect or a negative effect. Isn't that better? <laughs> um, so this is the definition of model dependence. This is, we worry about this when everybody else is working on data analysis and we're reading their results, okay? We don't worry about it for ourselves. Um, um, but, that, but this is the problem. It's the problem of model dependence. And that's actually the problem that matching can go after and, and, and really can help resolve. So let's, let's get rid of these equations and think about how we analyze the same data with matching, okay? So here's what, here's what matching can do. So matching prunes observations. I don't think it should have been called matching. I think it should have been called pruning, because that's basically what it does. You start with the data set, and you prune away certain observations under very specific conditions so that you don't create selection bias. And, and, then, uh, and then the result is that is the data set will have less model dependence, okay? less, less changes in results as a result of small, small specification decisions. After all, do you know whether this should be um, linear or quadratic in most applications? You know, you don't really know. Or even, like, there's no real theory that says it has to be quadratic. I mean, after all, there's a lot of curves, right? Um, so it's hard to really justify what it is. And it would be much better for us if the results did not depend upon deciding whether to put a squared term into the regression or deciding whether to log the dependent variable 
or deciding whether to put a prior on, on the analysis, or deciding whether to drop the outliers, or deciding whether to um, have the sample period only be from World War II to the present, or maybe World War I to the present. Right? You know, what's, what are we supposed to do? Right? You make those little decisions and it has a big effect, that gives us a lot of heartburn. Okay? Um, so let's get rid of this. Now let's do matching. I won't tell you, I'll tell you the method of matching later, but what matching does is pruning. The matching method up here pruned away those observations that are grayed out. Right? So we'll get rid of, right, see that? So grays those out, <coughs> deletes them. <coughs> and now we run the linear regression again, fit the linear regression to this, this the remaining data. The way we deleted the observation does not create selection bias um, because it turns out to be only a function of the explanatory variables, not the dependent variable. Um, now we run the regression, so the, the linear regression first, and that's the linear regression. So the causal effect now goes from blue to red, right? So no change, right? So the causal effect now is about zero. So, so T versus C controlling for education doesn't have an effect on the outcome, right? Everybody see? Okay. Um, uh, and so it, it actually changed the result, but that's what it is. Okay, now our goal is to reduce model dependence. So let me run the quadratic. Okay, I don't even have to click actually, because the quadratic's up there, up there also. In fact, if you look really closely, you can see a little bit of a difference. Okay, but the really interesting thing now is that the linear model and the quadratic model are giving basically the same answer. Right, so there's no more model dependence. Right. We've gotten rid of model dependence by doing matching. That's the point of matching. It gives you much more confidence in running the, the model. So uh, the other thing is, it's not like some complicated new procedure. It's, it's going to be relatively simple. Think of it as pre-processing. You have some procedure you were going to do, some data analysis procedure you were going to do already. You're going to run some regression, whatever it is. This is just pre-processing. You add something on ahead of time. You prune the data in a very specific way. Then you have your data set. You do whatever it is you were going to do originally. Okay, that's the that's the idea. Okay, um, so it's very convenient. It's simple. You don't have to change your method of calculating standard errors or anything else. It all works very simply, um, and the result is much less model dependence. You get to say when you're writing up your results that you've reduced model dependence, and so those evil reviewers out there can't get you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and when you're a wonderful reviewer. You should make the author do this because then you can trust their results more. Okay. <laughs> Not to anyone in this room, but you know. <laughs> okay. So let's uh, go in a little, little more deep. Um, and I mean, does everybody, everybody follow where, where I am? I mean, I, I really would like you to ask questions in this talk um, because it would personally insult me if you don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you have questions, please, please do. Okay. Okay, so this is the, uh, the general setup. Let's just go a little deeper and, and explain it. Um, uh, <coughs> without matching, imbalance between the treated and control groups um, uh, leads to model dependence. That's what leads to model dependence. If you have exact matching between the treated and control groups, it doesn't matter what model you run, you're pretty much going to get the same answer. So, so it's imbalance that leads, that leads to model dependence. Model dependence leads to researcher discretion. Right? If there's model dependence, then we get to decide which model to write up, the linear one or the quadratic one, right? which the sample, you know, all, all the millions of, of decisions, what you do with missing data, all those things. Um, model dependence leads to researcher discretion. Don't think of yourself, think of that other guy. Right? That other guy has too much discretion because when they have discretion, it leads to bias. Okay? Now, I don't, that's not a cynical remark. That's actually a result of research. Okay? If you leave somebody with discretion in doing data analysis, they will bias the results in their favor. Let, let, me, let me explain. As a result of scientific re research, so in psychology. So let me, let me explain this. If we're, if, what we're doing is we're basically in the situation of making a qualitative choice among a whole bunch of estimators, right? a whole bunch, a bunch of models. Let's suppose all the models are, um, are unbiased. So every model is, is a good model, but there's variability a, across them. Uh, if we make a qualitative choice among a set of, of un, unbiased models on the basis of the results, then you get, a, you get a biased estimator. Let me give you an example. Suppose you ran 50 pristine randomized experiments, every one of which was done exactly the right way. Now you're going to get different answers for the 50, 50 experiments just because of random variability. 
Now suppose you get to pick one on the basis of the results, not only on the basis of the design, but on the basis of the results, to write up. Okay? Well, you know, you could try to not be biased, but what's going to happen is you're going to be slightly in favor of your a priori hypotheses. Okay. So, um, and in fact, if you use that word plausibility, you know, oh, everything else is, good, is bad. Okay. So, what, what happens if you try hard to avoid the biases when doing analyses? And of course, typically, we don't have a whole lot of um, unbiased analyses to choose from. Some are, some are biased, and some are not biased, and we don't know which is which. And we have to make a choice, and we get to peek at the outcome. We get to peek at what's actually happening and what, what the result is that we could write up. And that peeking is going to cause bias. OK, what happens if we understand this and we try really hard to avoid the biases? Psychologists have studied this. And, um, and uh, so one quote is, conscientious effort doesn't avoid biases. Does not. So uh, hard, trying hard to avoid human biases uh, um, does, not, d does not work at all. Um, uh, okay, so why is that? That's because you don't have access to the mental processes that are causing you to make biased decisions, you and me and everyone. We're just, we have a, you all have a flaw, and that is that you're human, right? Um, and there's, there's no way to avoid that, because you're still human after you're trying, right? All right, so um, uh, what if, wait a second, what if we took experts, because we're all experts, right? What if we took experts and we had them uh, choose among a whole bunch of analyses on the basis of the results, right? Well, it turns out that experts overestimate their ability to control their own personal biases more than non-experts, and the most prominent experts, that would be us, okay, <laughs> are the most overconfident, okay? So don't give me this, you're an expert business, <laughs> okay? If you're an expert, that's a bigger problem. <laughs> Okay, wait a minute. Okay, suppose we take experts and we teach them about these psychological results. And we explain to them that the psychologists have demonstrated to us that we are human and therefore we tend to bias things imperceptibly in our favor. Doing a data analysis often involves hundreds of, of very small decisions, each one of which we really don't know whether it's right or not, but we're doing our conscientious best to try to make the right choices. Okay. But now we explain to us right, and, to the, and to the expert that, that, that what happens in those situations is that we tend to bias things in our favor. Okay? And, we, and, and therefore, please try to avoid those biases. What's the consequence? And then we also explain to them that you think you're an expert. Experts uh, overestimate their ability to, to avoid these. Don't do that. Okay? So correct for that. Okay? What's the consequence of that? We teach them. So as Nobel Prize winning psychologist Dan Kahneman explained, teaching psychology is mostly a waste of time. <laughs> it basically doesn't work. <laughs> okay? We try to, we use this at Harvard when the psychology department wants to get more positions. <laughs> um, so it basically, it basically doesn't work. So what happens without matching? Without matching, you get rid of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, what, that's without matching. With matching, you get rid of imbalance, so you have balance, you get rid of model dependence, you get rid of researcher discretion, and you get rid of bias. So once you have balance, you're okay. There aren't a, a hundred decisions to make where there are, but you're gonna get the same answer regardless of what your decision is across them. So model dependence is an incredibly important statistical problem. Okay, okay. in fact, if you think of the, the, the goal of statistics, quite a lot of it, is to automate away human discretion, right? That's sort of why we quantify things at the end of the day, right? If humans were just good at looking at a bunch of data by themselves and picking out the right answer, you know, we'd be fine, right? But it's, it's hard. Um, yeah. Before you go on, so I have a question about um, model dependence. Okay. Because the main problem is that you get to peak the results before you, you, you choose which one to, to write down. But then that, this, if this is true, then the implication is that the entire journal review process is flawed because <laughs> the editors and reviewers see the results and then they decide should we publish this article or not. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. So, so there is a way around that which, which um, is well-meaning and sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. So it's called pre-registration, which you probably know. So the idea is before you look at the results, when you're, before you collect the data, you say here's what I'm going to do. 
and, and I'm going to collect all these data, and I'm going to do the following analyses, and that's it. It used to be in educational psychology, uh, in some, some areas of Scott's psychology, you had to do that. And you would write, if you were writing a dissertation, you would, you would write a decision tree. You would say, if the T value was above 1.96, I would conclude that I was right. If it was below 1.96, I would conclude I was wrong. And, I would, and that's it. I'd get my PhD, I would conclude I was wrong, and that would be it. Like, there's no, you know, you could write a, a concluding chapter saying, you know, future research, but that would be it. No job. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I find there are some times when pre-registration is very helpful. But I learn a lot when I do, the da do, do data analysis. The talk, I gave, the talk I gave yesterday, if I had pre-registered that study, I would have given you a talk about automated text analysis, <laughs> not even in Chinese, in English. <laughs> Um, so I think automated. I mean, so I think pre-registration actually uh, is sometimes really wrong, but sometimes can protect you. Actually, I did a big study in Mexico where we randomly assigned to different communities hospitals. Like I literally, like I flipped coins in my office, and heads a community got. We built hospitals, and we get we brought in doctors and medicine and money to pay for it all. And tells well, your community hadn't had healthcare ever and you weren't going to get it for at least three or four more years. Okay. So that was, a, it was an evaluation of a, of a program. I would, certainly wanted that, wanted that pre-registered because if, I wanted to conclude that it was either working or not working depending upon the data, right? not depending upon the throngs of, 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 of local officials who were going to be fired if it didn't work. Right? So I brought them all into a room like this and I said, okay, here's what the results are going to look like. What, what, I'm going to draw a line, and below that line, it's going to be it didn't work, and above the line, it's going to be it's going to be work. And so, as much as possible, I tried to tie to tie my hands so that afterwards they didn't tie my hands and string me up. <laughs> right? So, um, by doing that, do you create a real incentive for the local people, officials, to put every effort to make it work? And does that then create a problem? That's an excellent point. You definitely, you definitely do give them an incentive to make it work. So, so what we did is we is the incent, the officials, of course, in the in that program, they had an incentive to make the program work because they, I mean, their jobs depended upon it. Mexican country of Mexico depended upon it. The healthcare of Mexicans depended. On it. So they had that incentive already. What we did is we gave them an incentive to to comply with the experimental treatment. Right? and to stop non-compliance. So compliance was that uh, we would randomly assign a community to get health care. It was easy to verify whether the hospital was built, but people in the community had to go affiliate themselves and their family to the, to the program. And then in the control group, they had to not affiliate to the program. Right? And, and so the officials had to make sure that happened. So they, we, gave them, we tried to set up those incentives. That's how, we used that to our advantage. Right? Oh, I avoided this question entirely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have a good theory, which you know actually can guide you to uh, testing whether supposedly it should be a linear or nonlinear relationship. Mm -hmm. Would that reduce the risk of uh, uh, model, you know, bias, model selection bias? Yes, absolutely. If we really have a theory, not 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 we. Uh, well, let me just clarify. <laughs> It's not only having a theory, the theory has to be right. Okay. <laughs> so if we have a theory that, that we really believe is right, ideally on the basis of prior empirical evidence, no problem. Okay. It's, it's just in the social sciences, we're, we're doing so many different things. You know, I, I remember during the AIDS crisis in the 1980s, I was on a plane sitting next to somebody um, uh, studying, studying HIV. And he was going to a conference with 16,000 with 16, people. 16,000 people studying one virus. And I was going to the American Political Science Association with 6,000 people studying every conceivable thing having to do with politics, right? <laughs> there was basically one person studying every, every one thing. So if you have that, you might be able to develop theories that are, that are really tested, in which case we're fine. Yes, absolutely. So, um, okay, so what's matching? Well, let, we'll have a dependent variable, which is Y, a treatment variable, which is treated or control. We can generalize that. We can have more categories. We can have continuous things. There's other things you can do. I'm going to stick with the simplest case for the, for the purposes of the talk, since the intuition uh, is, is the same. 
And then we have a list of what we would call pre-treatment confounders, things that are causally prior to the assignment of treatment versus control. And they account for all the important differences between uh, uh, the treatment and control on the outcome. Okay. Um, it's easy for me to say we just have a bunch, we just have all the confounders, but that's actually a huge decision, right? You have to make sure that you really know the thing, the, the differences. Uh, if you don't know, it's nice to be able to run a randomized experiment. T is then random. It's random, so it's unrelated to any x that you can think of and all the x's you didn't think of. That was a good invention, <laughs> okay? But we can't always do that, so we're we're stuck with choosing our x's. Okay, so that's our setup. Um, the treatment effect for treated observation I, just to make it simple, uh, the treatment effect, is just for that one observation, is the difference in the two potential outcomes. This is notation if, you, if you've heard of it. Um, one is observed, one is not observed. So it's treated observation I. So that one means it's treated, the zero means it's not treated. This observation is, is a treated observation, so this one is observed. It's not a control observation, so this value, that is the value of the outcome, that, that the, the outcome would have had if that observation were not treated, right? We don't get to see it, right? We don't know it. It can only be one or the other, is that. And the causal effect is the difference between those two things. They're not two different observations. They're the same observation. One's observed and one's not observed. In fact, I'm just going to get rid of that one there because we can see that's the value of the dependent variable. And this is the value of the dependent variable that it would have been if that observation had not gotten the medicine or whatever the treatment was. Okay, so that's what we care about for that one observation. We would then, um, a, a nice easy way to think about matching is we don't know that, we need to estimate that, where are we gonna get that from? We look for another observation, this is I, this is J, another observation which is the same as much as possible um, uh, based on the pretreatment compounders, where one got treatment and one didn't get treatment. If it's possible to find, we would, we would like that. So that's the idea. Well, we can estimate that if we have a good, a good control. The quantity of interest, we don't typically estimate for every single observation because there's lots of randomness. So we'll do something like the sample average treatment effect on the treated, which is merely the treatment effects averaged, that's the mean, um, over all the treated units. You can also do it over all, all the units or whatever you like. And then there's one other quantity of interest just to, just to focus, which is the, instead of the SAT, the sample average treatment effect on the treated, there's the feasible SAT, or SAT. Okay. <laughs> okay. I should make those who don't feel comfortable with English pronounce that, because we don't. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> feel comfortable, that is. Um, okay, so, um, so the feasible SAT is, is basically the same thing, except some treated units don't have a control unit that is easy, that, that, that's nearby. And so then at that point you prune the treat, treated unit also. You have to be careful because you've changed the quantity of interest. And so as part, it's sort of a little weird that as part of the statistical procedure, you change the quantity of interest. I think that's perfectly fine. It's often the case that, well, we only have data back to 1974. Uh, so then our quantity of interest is gonna be for 1974 to the present. Right? If we had data back to 1958, we'd use that too. <laughs> you know? So we changed the quantity of interest. Uh, you know the guy um, looking for his keys under the lamppost? You know that joke? Right? You know, like, like he's, he doesn't know where his keys are, and so he's a drunk looking for his keys, and he's looking under the lamppost, and they say, why are you looking under the lamppost? And he says, because the, the, it's light here, <laughs> right? which is silly. right? Actually, he's doing the right thing. He has no chance of finding his keys anywhere else. So he looks in the, in the place where he could conceivably find it. That's what we do as, as social scientists. <laughs> you know? We're not always drunk. <laughs> um, this is a big convenience, this procedure, because we can follow uh, this pre-processing step that is matching with whatever statistical procedure you would have used without matching and all the inferential uh, statistics follow. Um, we prune the, the uh, like in musical chairs, we prune the matches, the, the, the non-matches, the ones that don't get matched, um, and uh, that makes the control variables, that makes the confounders matter less. And so the modeling that is necessary to control for the confounders doesn't really matter, and we reduce imbalance, model dependence, research of discretion, and bias. So that's the, that's the slightly more te technical version of matching. Um, so, um, let me give you another perspective on what matching is. Uh, uh, matching is finding 
uh, the way we think about it is it's five, it's, we have a big, messy observational data set. We would have liked to, work to randomly assign treatment and control, and instead, uh, we have to do matching. And so one way of thinking about matching is taking this big, messy data set and looking inside for a subset of the data, oh, right here, which is, uh, which is pretty close to what would have been if we had randomized. So that's the idea. It's like looking for the hidden, ex randomized, pristine, hidden, randomized experiment inside your observational data set. The reason we're doing that is that in that randomized experiment, we could make an inference without much model dependence. In the whole data set, it would be really hard. So that's the idea. That's the idea of matching. Okay, now, since we're going to look for the randomized experiment, we should think about um, different types of experiments. Because what is it that we're going to approximate? Turns out there's two, there's many types of experiments, but there's two that are, that are particularly important um, for our case. The first is called complete randomization. It's a standard approach to, uh, it's, it's a classic experiment. where We take one person and we flip a coin, heads you get the medicine, tails you get the control. Then we flip another coin, heads you get the medicine, tails you get the control. We flip another coin, one, one coin for each person. That's the, that's the way it works. That's complete randomization. Another, another experiment is a fully blocked experiment. A special case of which is a matched pair experiment. So we, we, so we, we take one person, um, we, let's see, we take one person, we look for another person who's exactly the same in all respects. Oh, maybe that's me. Um, and, then, and, then we, and then we flip one coin for the two of us, and heads, you get the treatment, and, and, and I get control, and tails, I get the treatment, and you get the control. Okay. Let's say we match just on gender. So we have two, two males, uh, we flip the coin, when we're done flipping the coin, no matter what, we have one male in the treated group and one male in the control group. So we exactly match on that. If we had 10 variables that we matched on um, before we did flip the coin, the 10 variables would match exactly. If instead we did complete randomization and we flipped one coin for you and one coin for me and one coin for you and one coin for you and one coin for you, coin for you it could be just by chance that all the men ended up here and all the women ended up here where all the healthy people ended up here and all the unhealthy people ended up here. As n gets larger, that's not going to happen. But, you know, we only have so much time, right? We're doing the pro this project, we'd like to get on to the next project. You can't collect data forever. We don't have enough, enough money to be able to do that, right? <clears throat> um, so, it's, it, so in general, uh, you know, what's the difference between these two experiments? Well, the, their goal is to balance covariates. There are two kinds of covariates. The ones you know about and measured, the observed ones, and the ones you either don't know about or didn't measure, the unobserved ones. Under complete randomization, you balance on average, you know, if you get enough, enough observations or calculating you know, cross, cross samples, at the, the observed data and the, and the total miracle of randomization is that you also balance the unobserved variables, the ones you don't see and didn't even think of. So that's totally great. But a fully blocked experiment or a matched pair experiment is even better because you get exact matching on the observed variables and uh, you still get, on average, uh, balance um, between the, uh, the unobserved variables. Everybody follow what I mean? Okay. All right, so fully blocked experiment dominates complete random, oh, and when I did the, well, the <coughs> fully blocked experiment dominates complete randomization for imbalance, model dependence, that is, there's less under a fully blocked experiment, less or more power, uh, more efficiency, less bias, uh, fewer research costs, uh, fewer research costs. So if you're running in experiments and you're in graduate school, you will get out of graduate school faster if you do this. Okay? Um, uh, there's, there's more robustness. Um, uh, we, in this, this, is this, this is a paper, actually, in which uh, we described that paper I described, the experiment we ran in Mexico, and we were able to estimate how big the standard errors would be under these two designs. And uh, the standard errors were as much as 600% smaller with the matched pair experiment than with the randomized experiment. So it's way better to do that, okay? Um, all right, so that's the experiments. We're not running experiments today. We're just doing observational data analysis, okay? Um, so the goal of each matching method in observational data analysis, propensity score matching, which I will describe in more, de more detail so you know what it is, um, is complete randomization. If it works really well, you're trying to get to complete randomization. If you, if you look at every other matching me method, the goal is a fully blocked experiment. So propensity score matching has lower standards. It doesn't try to achieve as much. 
Okay? Um, so that's one hint that you would prefer other methods to propensity score matching because the goal is better. Of course, if you were able to get to complete randomization, that would be pretty good for an observational study. Um, but if you could get to a fully blocked experiment, that would even be gooder. That's a joke. <laughs> okay. um, however, it turns out, so other methods uh, dominate PSM, the mathematical term. Right? They, you know, they're, they're just uniformly better than PSM. However, it gets worse for propensity score matching in a way that I'll describe, in a surprising way, in a way that took us years to understand. Okay. All right, so let me now describe, to you, describe for you three methods of matching. I'll give you a visual version and a mathematical version so we have a good feel for, for what we're talking about. Um, and then I'll show you the consequences. So first is Mahalanobis distance matching. Um, uh, it approximates a fully blocked experiment, not, not merely complete randomization. Uh, the general idea is you pre-process with matching, then run whatever statistical procedure you, you're going to run. The way the matching works is you take each person or unit and you figure out the distance to, the, to another unit that didn't receive treatment. And how do, you, how do you measure distance? This is the Mahalanobis distance. This is a standardization. It's basically like the Euclidean distance, but standardized. Um, in general, don't standardize your variables, right? Because standardization basically throws away the substance. It's statisticians trying to make themselves invariant to us, right? right? You, you don't really want that. You'd rather use Euclidean distance instead of, instead of this. But in any event, it's just a mathematical way of taking each observation, which has, let's say, 20 variables, which, is, which are your pre-treatment confounders, and figure out how close the values of those 20 variables are for me and for you. That's the idea. And that's, this is the particular mathematical way of doing it. You then match each treated unit to the nearest control. Uh, control units in the simple case are not reused and they're pruned if they're, if they're unused. Um, and then when, once we have all the matches of every treated unit to the nearest control, right, every, all those matches set up, we then have a caliper. And a caliper is the, the longest, the largest distance we're willing to tolerate. Beyond that caliper, we delete the treated units too. So that's the basic idea. There's a lot of adjustments to this basic method. OK, let me show you a visual version of this. Okay. So we have two uh, explanatory variables, two confounders, uh, age and education. Okay. Um, here's some treated units. Here's some control units. Let me just be clear that in this graph, there's no dependent variable. Okay. I mean, there is a dependent variable in the analysis, but not in this graph. Um, so these are two explanatory variables, and this is, a, a, this is Chinese, I'd like to point out. <laughs> I don't really know what it says, but I, but I know it's bad. I know it's bad, because it says Windows. <laughs> okay. um, so we have, um, <laughs> I could have meant a lot of things. Right? Um, anyway, so we have uh, treated units and control units. What we're going to do now, in the space of the variables of the pre-treatment confounders, which in this simple case is just age and education, we're going to take, take each treated unit and find the nearest control, nearest measured at, as the, the Mahalanobis distance. And so this is, this is actually the answer. That what's the nearest treated, uh, control to this treated unit? It's here. What's the nearest control to this treated unit? It's here, you know, et cetera. So that's how, that, that's how that works. So these guys are the ones that lose the game of musical chairs. Do they play musical chairs in Taiwan? So this is a joke. No one has any idea of what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's a kid's game. It's, it's a kid's game. What's it called? What's it called? Oh, OK. okay. <laughs> I should have just said that. <laughs> um, so these are, the, um, these are the ones that lose out, and they, they don't get matched. And so we grade them out, and then we make them go away. Okay. Um, uh, and then the, 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 we throw away the, you know, the, what was matched to what. And this is now our pruned data set that you can do whatever you want with. That's the way, that's the way Mahalanobis distance matching works. Let me do one more example of Mahalanobis distance to give you a feel for the best case. Here's the best case. Again, we have age, age and education. For every treated unit, there is a really close control unit. You see that? Right on top, essentially right on top of it. Tr treated control, treated control, treated control. There's a whole bunch of other controls which we don't really need. They're all grayed out already, and we'll just make them go away. That's our data set. This is a wonderful data set. It's a beautiful data set because no matter what, no matter what model you run, you're not going to be able to predict which unit is treated or controlled. Right? If education is higher, is it more likely to be T or C? There's no effect. 
How about age? If age is higher, is it more likely to be T or C? No effects. How about you include age squared, age cubed, right? It's not going to predict. How about the interaction between the two? It's not going to matter. Right? That's the advantage. That's the, that's the model, reduction, model dependence reduction. Okay. So this is the best case from the Halanovas distance mesh. And everything works just as you'd expect. Okay. Um, it's not going to be that way for propensity score matching, but I'll get there. Okay. Second method is course and exact matching. This is the easy method that we've worked on that I've, I've told you about at the beginning. Um, it's, uh, I think, the most powerful, really easy to use approach. Um, uh, it approximates, again, a fully blocked experiment, not merely a completely randomized experiment. Again, it works by pre-processing matching and then doing estimation of difference, in, uh, of difference in means or model or whatever statistical procedure you were going to run. Here's how matching works for, for, for CEM, or course and exact matching. Um, you temporarily course in X as much as you're willing. Let me explain what that means. Um, so if you have years of education as your variable, um, we know in data analysis we'll sometimes course in this to grade school, high school, college, graduate school, if you, if, if you can translate that into Taiwan. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because <laughs> right? often it's the degree that matters, not only the number of years of education. So if you're willing, and it's a choice as to whether you're willing to course in it or not. It's a serious data analytic choice, but I think we understand it. Okay. So you course it. Um, why do you course it? Well, because you can't find an exact match on the original variables. It's very, very hard. And so we make it easier in this very specific way. Uh, sometimes making it easier is actually better because you don't want to match a, a college dropout with a first year graduate student. right? But you might be willing to, to, to match two graduate students or somebody who is, uh, you know, who's, who's gotten almost through college but is clearly going to go to graduate school with a graduate student. Right? So sometimes the, the cut points are really valuable. Um, OK. Um, you then just do exact matching on the course and x. So you take the course and variables, and you find two people that are, you know, are, are both in graduate school, and you match them. Uh, not only on that variable, but on all the other variables. Uh, another way of thinking of the same thing is that you sort observations into strata, uh, each with unique values of all of the, all of the control variables on the, uh, or, or on the course and scale. Um, you then prune with any stratum that doesn't have zero treated or zero controls, and you pass on the original units, the ones that, uh, that, that wind up in the same bin with others. Anything else you throw away, and that's, that's how CEM works. There's one slight difference in estimation, which is you have to use some weights, which I'll, I'll show you in the next slide. Um, OK, so let, let me show you a picture. Again, we have age and education, and we have treated and treated and control units. Instead of looking at each treated unit and finding the nearest control, what you do is, is we break up age and we break up education okay, into these course and bins. Now, what, the way I'm going to break this up is to use the, the humor of my co-author. Um, uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so this is, these are at least intended to be funny. Um, my, my, when I give this talk with my graduate students, students, they say, oh, high school, BA, MA, PhD. Second PhD, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> um, so these have to be meaningful, of course, right? You have to have the right, you have to have the right categories. Um, uh, once you have those categories, you throw away the original scale temporarily. And you draw these, uh, these bins uh, defined by the categories. This works not only with two variables, but of course with any number of variables. Um, uh, and now we look in each of these bins. And in each of the bin, if there's a treated and controlled unit, at least one treated, at least one control, we keep them. If, uh, so we're going to keep these. We're going we're to keep these. But if there's only one, these are only treated, there's nothing to compare them to. And all the control units are infinitely far away on this scale because they're not in that bin. So we throw these away. We prune these, we prune these, we prune these, we prune these, we keep these, we keep these, even though there's only one in there. We prune, 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 prune. So that's what it looks like. Okay. See? Right? Um, here, so far, the example you gave, uh, you always have uh, more cases in the control group. Yes. Uh, fewer cases. You know, under the treatment. Uh, any particular reason for that? Yeah, um, so there's a few reasons. Um, of course, you can change C and T, okay. right? And so it doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, but uh, it, it's easy for me to say, I'm going to keep all my T's mm -hmm. 
and not and, and only prune the, the C's, and that way I keep the quantity of interest the same. But can you reassign some of the C's to T? No. You can you can make the I mean there's nothing saying that the treatment is the people or the people receiving the medicine and the people receiving the, the placebo or the control. We could could call the control the, the treatment and the medicine the, right. So you can just switch them. There's no problem. Um, but the reason I'm doing this is that uh, I'm making my quantity of interest the causal effect for the treated units. Then I'm pruning away some controls, and I don't change the causal. I don't change the definition of the quantity of interest. I'm also telling you in 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 the same breath that it's okay to change the quantity of interest, but for pedagogical reasons, I don't want to talk about that at the same time. That's the reason I'm doing it. It's often the case that that we're in a situation like this, but not always. Sometimes we have about the same numbers. Okay. Um, okay. So so we have this. Remember, I said there was some weighting. Why is there weighting? Well, what's the causal effect just in this bin? Well, they're all, the compounders all have about the same value, which is fine, but there's more C's than T's. So what you do is you take the average of these C's and subtract it from, the av from just that one T, and that would be the causal effect, right? Or here, you don't have to wait. Here, you don't have to wait. Here, you'd wait. So let me just show you the weights. We can do weights like that, just visually, right? Throw away the bins. That's our data set, okay? You can either average within here, and you don't have to think about the weights, or you have one whole data set with the weights. Same thing. Okay. Okay. So that's course of exact matching. Let me show you the best case of course of exact matching. Again, this beautiful data set with very fine bins, right? Very fine bins. So every treated unit is, is essentially on top of a control unit. We have really good matches. Um, we're we're not coarsening much. Um, we, we throw away anything that doesn't match. Again, this is a beautiful data set where the confounders have no effect on predicting what's treated and, and what's controlled. No problem. Okay, that, then that's, the, that's the analysis that, that we do. Okay, now the last method is propensity score matching. So this is the most commonly used method that's used in 100,000 scholarly articles. 100,000 scholarly articles. Okay. Um, it approximates a, a, a completely randomized experiment, not a fully blocked experiment. So it has lower standards. Okay. Uh, again, we're going to pre-process and we're going to do estimation by any method we want. How does, does pre-processing or matching work? Well, here's the way it works. First, we reduce all of our 25 covariates to one variable. How do we do that? We run a logit of the treatment variable. This is not the analysis model. This is just for the propensity score. We run, a, we run a logit where the, treat, the treatment variable, the zero one treatment variable, is temporarily the dependent variable. And the explanatory variables in this logit are all the, the confounders. And, and, that, and the predicted value of treatment is called the propensity score. It's the propensity to receive treatment. Everybody following? So the, this is the equation for a logit model. Okay. Um, <clears throat> You then calculate the distance by just the distance, the, ab the absolute distance between the, a treated unit and the control unit on the propensity scores. Okay? Um, and then you match each treated unit to the nearest control on that scale. Uh, again, control units are, in the simplest case, are not reused. They're pruned if they're unused. We prune matches if the distance is greater than some caliper, which is the, how large a distance we're willing to tolerate we throw away the rest. Um, and there's lots of adjustments to this basic model that don't work, that matter, but don't matter for this argument. Okay? Let me show you this visually. So we have age and education again. Here's our, here's our treated and uh, control units. Um, here's the propensity score. This is the probability of receiving treatment. Okay? At least the estimated probability of receiving treatment. It goes from low to high. So we run that logit where we predict T versus C as a function of age and education and uh, project those over to this scale. So now every unit is on this scale. We then temporarily throw away all the data, and we only pay attention to this one dimension. So now you should, you should have in your head this idea that we just had two, a, a two-dimensional thing reduced to one dimension. And in general, we might have 50 variables that are still reduced to one dimension. So we're throwing stuff away, right? Right, okay, okay. So now they're projected over here. What happens? Well, we take each treated unit and match it to the nearest control on this scale. Not this scale, but this scale. We throw away, we, we match them, we throw away the ones that don't get matched, right? Um, and then the, and that's, that, that's our data set. We project it back to the scale, and there's now fewer observations here, and that's what we do. So we ignore the original scale to do the matching. Uh, we match on the propensity score scale. 
And that's, what, that's the idea of propensity score. Um, let's look at the best case for propensity score. Where, and this is going to be our first hint. So again, this is a beautiful data set where each treated unit is right on top of a control unit. And there's, there's a bunch of others. Uh, we project them all over here. Now, they could, I made up this example so they can project anywhere. I'm going, to predict, I'm, I'm going to use the best case for a propensity score, at least in theory. They will have the same propensity score. If you run a randomized experiment and you're flipping coins, the propensity score is 0.5. Right? Everybody, every unit has a 0.5 probability of receiving treatment. So now I'm going to imagine, in this particular example, everybody has a propensity score of 0.2. So uh, one out of five receives treatment, the rest receive control. Um, so you go over here, okay, whoops, you go over here, and now we're going to match. Now what does matching look like if all the propensity scores match exactly? How would you know what unit to keep and what unit to, to, to drop? So suppose you're going to prune some observations. On, the, on this scale, they all match exactly, so which ones would you drop? You'd have to drop at random, right? Okay. So you're deleting observations at random. That doesn't seem like a good idea, does it? <laughs> okay, that's the problem, right? If the propensity scores match exactly, which is good, supposed to be good, you're deleting observations at random. What data set do you have that you would wish to delete observations at random before you ran the experiment, right? Doesn't that just degrade things? There isn't any way that it could conceivably help, right? Right, okay. Okay, so that's gonna be my data set. Now here's the next thing. So we just had the, we, remember here we started with a beautiful data set. There's an exact match for every observation. Then we do matching by propensity score and that's the data set we have. That treated unit is not exactly on top of, of, of the control units. So we, we use propensity score matching exactly the way it was designed and the result is that we don't get exact matches. That means that can you use education to predict these? Well, not very well because, because overall they're random. But in specific cases, yes, you can. Yes, you can predict whether you have treatment or control on the basis of, of age and education. And if you had a big complicated model, you could predict which of these were, were in which place on the basis of the covariates to some degree. Okay? And that gives you some extra model dependence for no reason that you don't really want. Okay? Even though it's achieving its objectives, it's leaving model dependence on the table. And that's what we're going to try to, we're going to, try to avoid. Okay, so, we're, so, so I add a little part of the title here. It's, it's like if I haven't said it enough times. Okay, so it's suboptimal. Okay, so, so let me summarize. Propensity, propensity score matching's statistical properties, or they have it has low standards. It sometimes helps, but it never optimizes. Um, it is efficient relative to complete randomization, um, but it is inefficient relative to the more powerful full blocking. Um, other methods usually dominate. Other methods of matching are usually better. Um, so what, what propensity score matching gets you is that if you have exact matching um, between the treated, between the control units and the treated units, if you have exact matching, that implies that you have exact matching on the propensity score. It does not work the other way. Everybody, in the literature, everyone interprets this as working the other way. That does not work. It is not true. It is not true that if you have exact matching on the propensity scores, you get exact matching on the covariates. It's not true. Maybe I should say that again. No. <laughs> okay. Um, second is, second is, and this is something that I haven't explained to you before, is this is the thing that took us a lot, a lot of time to figure out. It's called the, we call it the propensity score paradox. When you do better, you do worse. What the heck is that? Okay. So let me explain this. Um, so, to, so to begin with, random matching increases in balance. Remember I said propensity score matching randomly deletes observations? Okay, so now I'm gonna convince you, I want to convince you that randomly deleting observations doesn't keep the treatment and control groups about the same. It, it, it spreads them farther apart. That's a surprise. Okay. But think of how far you are to the nearest person in the room. Okay. Now imagine I randomly deleted half of you. Actually, I shouldn't say it quite that way. <laughs> Suppose half of you randomly left the room. In fact, if we could take it, every other person left the room. Now think of how close you would be to the next person. You'd be farther away. Right? So there would be not as good matches. Right? So that's actually, that's actually what happens. Um, when propensity score matching approximates complete randomization, uh, 
When it, when it, in other words, you start pruning with propensity score matching and it does the right thing. When it gets to complete randomization, it is matching at random. Okay? Uh, it, so that, that's basically the idea. If you, if you get to um, all the propensity scores being the same, then you're literally matching at random or, or constant with and straight. So you're pruning at random. If you're pruning at random, you are uh, producing imbalance. And imbalance leads to inefficiency. Inefficiency leads to model dependence, and model dependence leads to bias. So I'm making these strong claims here about what 100,000 scholarly articles have done, but let me show you an example. Okay. Um, oh, and if, there's, uh, if the data have no good matches, the paradox won't be a problem, but you're really cooked anyway because the, there's no good matches in there. Okay. Um, uh, if people ask me at this, at this point, um, doesn't propensity score matching solve the curse of dimensionality problem? No. The curse of dimensionality problem is not something to be solved. It's just a fact of the universe, right? It's just like, that's just, the, it's just a fixed thing. It doesn't get to be solved, okay? Um, no. <laughs> okay, and in fact, the paradox gets worse as you have more covariance. All right, so let me, let me show you an example. Propensity score matching is, is blind where other methods can see. Okay, so here's, a, here's an example. We, we have covariate one and covariate two. And I made this as a simulated case. In the bottom right hand corner, I randomly created a two data sets in this square. Well, I'm sorry, one data set of randomly generated treated units and randomly generated controls. Okay, so all the red ones are, are this, is complete, this is a completely randomized experiment. They're random with respect to the first covariate and random with respect to the second covariate. They're not exactly matched, but, they're, but it's, it, it's quite good. Okay? It's just not great. Great is up here. Great is a matched pair experiment where each unit, each treated unit, is uh, matched almost exactly to each control. Not exactly. I left a little bit of random variability in there. Okay. So this is a, a, a beautiful experiment. This is a pretty experiment, but not quite beautiful. Okay. Um, and now, just to make it the usual observational data sets that we get, I add in a whole bunch of messy control units that are far from the treated units in either experiment. And I put these all together, and I imagine that we're going to analyze them all together. Okay. Um, and so, so what do we do? Okay. So, so now I'm going to explain what these two figures are on the right-hand side. This is one of a thousand data sets I created in the, in the same way. Uh, the first row of pixels here corresponds to this particular data set. And the other rows correspond to the other thousand data sets I created. So I only need to describe the first row because the others came out the same. All right, what did I do? What I did is I pruned one observation from this data set. Now, if you were going to prune observations, you'd want to prune these guys first, right? Okay. And then you'd probably want to prune these, and then if you had to, you'd prune these. Right? That's, that's the order. Now, how Novus distance does the right thing? It first, starting from the left to the right, it, it, that's the order in which they're pruned, color-coded co color by these. So it first prunes the black ones. It first prunes these, just as you would want. These Cs are very far from the Ts. Then it prunes the red ones, because these Ts are somewhat far from the Cs. Not, they're not as bad as these, but they're, they're, they're much better, they're, they're, much, they're worse than these. So it makes sense. First you prune the, the black ones, then you prune the red ones, and then you're left with the blue ones. Everybody see? That's Mahalanobis distance from the left to the right. What happens with propensity score? We start with the left. It does the right thing at first. It sees this, these are bad, and it, and it prunes those. Once it's pruned these, see, we've, we've already gotten to here. Once it's pruned all the black ones, it's left with these two. Propensity score matching can only see a completely randomized experiment. It can't see that a, a, a matched pair experiment is better. It just doesn't know the difference between these two experiments. It's not trained. It just can't. It just was never taught that, 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 that a matched pair experiment is better than a completely randomized experiment. And so it doesn't know. And so when you ask it with these two to prune, it, it, it can't tell the difference. You see, you see the, the red and the blue are all sort of random because it looks the same to it. It's calculating distances based on the propensity score, not distances based upon the data in this, in this space. Everybody follow? OK. And you'll never do this again? Okay. <laughs> okay. OK, let me give you another example. Um, so just on the left side here, I create this blue square. 
and I randomly put uh, a control dots in that square and the blue dots. So blue dots are randomly spaced all in this square. In the, in the sort of pink square, slightly uh, moved to the top left, top right, um, I put treated units. So the red dots are randomly scattered in this square. In the overlapping area, I have both blue dots and both red dots. Up here, I only have red dots. And over here, I only have blue dots. Okay? So if we're going to do, do matching, we want matching to find the overlapping area. Everybody see? So this is a good case for propensity score matching because there's no, um, there's no exact match experiment here. This is just a completely randomized experiment, just as propensity score matching intends to find. Okay? So what does it do? Well, first we'll look at Mahalanobis distance matching, and then we'll get there. So Mahalanobis distance matching matches each treated unit, uh, the red, to the nearest control. Each treated unit to the nearest control. Each treated unit to the nearest control. It's a little hard to see, um, but the darkness of the line is the order in which they're proved. Right? That's what that says, but you can't quite see that. But anyway, any it does exactly what you would expect. When they're close, it, 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 it's much less likely to prune it. And the ones it prunes are the, are the longest distances, which are the red ones here, which have to go pretty far, and the blue ones here, which have to go pretty far to find a red one. Okay? So this is what you would expect. Let me now show you propensity score matching. So propensity score matching looks like this. It's blind on what it can only see in one dimension. Right? So this, this point here is matched to this point, even though there's real there's nearby points that are closer. There's no point in it doesn't make sense, but it, but it makes sense to it because it can only see in one dimension. That's what this is. Everybody see? Okay. Now let me let me go one more step, take the same data. And until now, in my simulations, I haven't had a dependent variable. So let me show you the exact consequence of doing this stuff by making up a dependent variable with those data. So I have to, have a, I have to make the dependent variable. Where do I get it from? So I make it from this model. This is my model. So my, my new dependent variable that I'm going to make is equal to the causal effect, 2 times the treatment, plus the control units. So the, the uh, value of the control units, um, sorry, the, these are the control units, x1 and x2. We'll go back over there. So, so that's x1, that's x2. I, 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 the, the coefficient on both of them I just left as 1, so I didn't have to, have to write them in there. So this is my, it's basically, I, I, I generated y as a regression, and the causal effect is 2. Okay. Now, here's what I did. I'm trying to measure model dependence. So how am I going to do that? So what I did is I simulated what we might do in the privacy of our own office or dorm room. Okay. What would we do? Right. We, we would go spend two years collecting the data, bring it all the way back into, the, in, into our room. The door is closed. There's one light over our head. Right? The computer screen is a glare in our, in our eyes. We set up the, the analysis, and we, we, do our, we run our regression once. That's it, and then we publish it, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> right? You run it again with uh, you know, a different time time period, and then you do deal with missing data in a different way. You do all kinds of things that can generate model dependence. They're for good reasons. They are actually for good reasons. But we know that the discretion, as I showed you earlier, can lead to bias. Okay. So um, how do I simulate that? So what I did is I ran, I, I'm going to come up with a whole bunch of regressions that are simulating that. Here's one regression, which is the right one. Then I ran a regression with x squared, x1 squared. Then I ran a regression with x2 squared. Then I ran a regression with x1 times x2. Then I ran a regression with x1 times x2 and x squared. I ran 534 regressions. Okay. So, and I estimated that 2 in every case. Right? I, mean, I want to get 2. I want to get to the number 2. I don't know what the truth is. I mean, I do because I, I generated the data. We can do that at Harvard. You know? We created the world. You know? <laughs> um, but in each one of these 534 regressions, the point is to estimate that number, which the truth is 2. So, and what's model dependence? Model dependence is the variation across the 534 regressions. Right? So I'm going to literally calculate, I'm going to run the 534 regressions, and then I'm going to calculate the variance across all of them. So that's what I did. That's that point right there. This is the variance across the regressions. Okay? Then what do I do? According to, um, uh, to Mahalanobis distance matching to begin with, I find the worst match. I prune that, and then I rerun all 534 regressions, and I, and I calculate the variance across the estimates of the causal effect. And it comes down a little. And then I find the worst match that's left. I delete that one. 
and then I run the 534 regressions again, and I calculate model dependence again. And what happens is, as we delete observations that are matched badly, we reduce the variance across the 534 regressions, thereby, or, or that is, reducing model dependence. And eventually, model dependence, basically, you get rid of all of it. That's what Mahal Mabas distance matching does. Everybody follow it to begin with? OK. Here's what happened with propensity score matching. At the beginning, it does the right thing. It goes all the way down until this is probably the point at which it's, re it's reached approximately com uh, complete randomization. At that point, it's blind. What happens? It keeps matching. It keeps matching on the basis of random, de random deletions. What does it do? Well, it starts increasing in balance. It's randomly deleting observations. It's making things worse and worse. You are throwing away observations, and it's making things worse. You're throwing away observations in order to make things better. It's like walking into a shoe store and giving them some money, and the, the proprietor saying, may I please have your shoes now? Right? You expect a pair of shoes from him. Right? You're born, you want to buy a pair of shoes from him. But instead, you give him money, and you also give him your shoes. Right? That doesn't seem like a good procedure. <laughs> right? OK, so now let me, this is model dependence. The vertical axis is the variance across the estimates of two. And it, re it reduces as you prune for Mahalanobis distance, makes it worse eventually for propensity score. Now let's look at bias, which is actually estimating that number two. Same regressions, but in each case, I want to actually estimate the number two. This is the truth. The horizontal <laughs> axis is the number of units pruned again. The vertical axis, now here's what I'm going to do for the vertical axis here. So we ran 534 regressions. Which, which one do you pick? Okay. I'm going to say that you might be slightly biased in favor of your prior hypotheses. Okay. So how do I model that right, in this simulation? So I'm going to imagine that you just run 534 regressions and you pick the maximum. Okay. You wouldn't do that, but, but they would. right? Okay. So we're going to pick the maximum. So that's the worst bias you could have, basically, with all this extra discretion. So for starters, with no matching, the estimate is about four, even though the truth is two. With Mahalanobis, as you prune the worst possible observation, the worst possible match, you reduce the bias down to two, down to two, down to two, and essentially gets all the way down to two. For propensity score matching, it's definitely doing better, doing better, gets all the way down to about here, and then it starts, and then it starts to take your shoes away. Right? It, starts, it starts to make things worse, and it diverges away from two. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, now you can say to me, okay, you had, very, you had a lot of fun making up data. What about real data? Okay, uh, so here's real data. So this is an actual article in the Journal of Politics um, uh, where uh, we start off on the horizontal axis with a number of units pruned. The vertical axis is imbalanced, like that variance. Uh, this is the raw data. So the raw data, with no units pruned, has this level of imbalance. Now, let's just do the one that makes sense, so Mahalanobis distance matching. We start here, we prune the worst observation, uh, we calculate imbalance, and, we, and it goes down. We prune the worst observation, we calculate imbalance. Oh, sorry, this is Mahalanobis distance matching. So imbalance keeps going down and down and down. That's just exactly what you would expect. A course of exact matching is pretty much the same thing. Okay. Now let's do, uh, before I get to the progressive score matching, just to, to orient ourselves, I randomly deleted observations. No one would ever do that, but let's just, let's just see what it looks like. If we randomly delete observations, this is what happens. It actually gets worse and worse. Okay. Um, so, uh, so but by the way, if, if that's not comfortable, imagine we have a, a sample survey and, we, and we're estimating the mean. Right. Well, what happens as we randomly add observations to our data set? Well, the standard error is, you know, is, 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 is sigma over the square root of n. Right? So as we get more observations, the standard error drops. Same thing in reverse. As we delete observations randomly, the standard error, the variance, the, the, the model dependence, the imbalance increase. That's basically all we're saying. Um, so that's, that's randomness. Now, what about propensity score matching? Well, it really is bad. <laughs> what happens in real data is it looks pretty much like a random plot. This is not a procedure that is designed to help you. Well, it's designed to help you, but it doesn't help you. This is a procedure that will hurt you, right? Because it basically increases imbalance as you, as you delete observations. This is one article from 2012. This is an article from 2011 by, by my co-author, Rich Nielsen. 
um, former student, now a uh, professor at MIT. Um, uh, and, um, uh, we start here with raw data. Again, CEM and Mahalanobis makes things go down. Um, random matching, again, it looks like that. This is what propensity score matching does. If you start here, you add, you, 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 you continue to prune, and it just makes things worse very, very fast. Okay. So we were worried. We, I saw this graph before I really understood, before I could explain this the way that I explained it today. And we really didn't understand what was going on. This is a method, after all, that was used in 100,000 articles, right? I didn't really understand the intuition. So what we did is, is we advertised on the web. And we said, is anybody doing matching? Is anybody estimating cause, causal effects? Would you like some help? Send us your data sets. We promise, we promise not to publish them, not to, tell anyone, not to tell anyone you sent us the data. We will do an analysis for you, and we will send you back the analysis and then we won't tell anybody that you did it, or, or, or we won't scoop you. Okay, just so we can get more experience with a diverse array of data sets. And we got um, more than 20 data sets from from people that, that wanted us to do their data analysis for them. And believe me, they all look quite like this. Okay, sometimes, occasionally, the line starts here, goes down, and then goes back up. But um, it always goes up in the end. Okay, then we knew there was a systematic pattern. Then we figured out. Then we figured out what it was. So this is. In real data, it's actually very common to look like this. Um, in real data, where people are pushing as far as they can, that's what we do in observational data analysis, right? We push as hard as we can. We, we, we get a new telescope. We set it on 10. We stand up on our toes. We stretch out our neck. We squint, right? We look. That's what we do, right? Well, that, that when you use propensity score matching, it just makes things worse. OK, okay so I think I could. Um, uh, I could keep going and describe the matching frontier that I, that, that I did, or I could stop and take some questions. Maybe, uh, maybe I should stop and take questions. Great, so, so I'll say I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs>